It's pretty incredible to think about. But right now, because of coronavirus, about 95% of all Americans are living under some sort of order to stay home. That's pretty much everyone in a country of more than 328 million people. Being shut in day after day can be stressful and sad and lonely and boring. But sometimes it truly can be joyful. Those of us who love music, and I'm definitely one of them, we can't go to shows, we can't go to the club, we can't get together and just sing. But creatives are creative. We can and are finding new ways to keep the music going. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. Even though we're social distancing, of course, there's some sense of community that's been brought out of that that is kind of new and wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been on this big, huge shutdown. I'm Tremaine Lee, and this is Into America. And today, just a few of the stories of people making and using music in these difficult times. To help me, I called up an old friend. Hello, Bonsu. How are you, sir? I followed Bonsu Thompson's career long before we were friends. He's written for a lot of my favorite music and culture magazines. And he's really connected to the music industry. So when we decided to do an episode about music in this moment, I said I got to get Bonsu on the line. How are you doing? Uh, I have my days on, on, on a macro level. I'm I'm truly blessed. The family's pretty healthy. I'm in good health, but you know it's just it's I, I go through a lot of anxiety. I think we're all going through some level of of corona induced anxiety uh, through the quarantine, but we're finding ways to push through. And for a lot of us, it's music. Oh, I mean, yeah, music is a lifeline. It's been since since birth. Honestly, it's uh it's almost like a part of my heartbeat. And, you know, Instagram and social media has been this great kind of vehicle for the music. Have any of the moments that we've seen stood out for you? Oh, I mean, history is being made during these times on Instagram. Have you been attending the uh, D-Nice's uh, homeschool parties? Brother's crazy. Welcome to homeschool. It's plus 14. It's giving me life and joy <laughs> and strength. So, for those who don't know, uh, DJ D Nice is a legend in hip hop. I've been making records since 1986, man. I was like 15 years old. But I then, Club Quarantine. He's DJing from his his apartment in in LA. BX all day. Let's take it back to my first record. Let's go. We're celebrating all over the world. Let's go. Yo, what's up, Blast? D Nice is a friend of mine, and you know, uh, I've been to a number of his parties throughout the years. And I just assumed it was just a regular party. I think it was on a Thursday. I randomly went into it. Check it out, hear some music. We're over 8,000. And I stayed in there for, I, stayed, I think I maybe came in there at the midpoint and stayed in there throughout the whole night. We're about to crack 10,000 in this room. We're about to crack 10,000. Went back Friday night. Old school, Melba, we love you, let's go. It was even better. It got up to over 20,000 people. Let's dance now. And then Saturday night, it, it was historic. 50,000 people in here, 50,000 people in this room, and we are celebrating together. Yes, we understand what's going on out here. And on Saturday night, it crossed 100,000 viewers. <laughs> we got 100,000 people in here rocking with us right now. This is absolutely insane. We started this party five days ago. 100,000 people, let's go. Club Quarantine pulled together Oprah. Oprah's in here. Bernie Sanders. Oh my gosh, Bernie Sanders is in here too. This is just too much. What's up, Bernie? Stevie Wonder. We love you, Stevie Wonder. Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama's in here. Michelle Obama's in here. 
I don't know why I'm nervous because, you know, I already DJ for it, but I'm still nervous. Like, this is just crazy. But we're going to play something from Michelle. Michelle, this is for you. And we're all there with everyone we know as well. <laughs> like, it was an amazing experience. We are one in here together. We are celebrating together. We're fighting this together. Once again, it's D-Nice. Oh, my gosh. Rihanna just stepped in here. Riri, what's up? Oh, my gosh. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't expecting the, the community value and the fellowship that ensued. I mean, people were actually talking on the comment sections if it was an actual party. Like somebody, you know, might go pop in and go, Bone Soup, what are you drinking? Saying what's up to each other, doing virtual high fives, everything. Um, can I have this dance? And it was, and having been separated from everybody, you saw like how much your body thirsty. It's almost like you're ever thirsty, but not realize how thirsty you are until you start drinking water. Right. <laughs> and you realize how much you needed that. Exactly. Like your body tells you, like, it's not going to be a sip. We want this entire bottle. That's how it felt. We've been partying here for seven hours straight. A thousand kisses from you. Speaking of taking things and people for granted, um, and this time it's been rough on a lot of those gig workers, including working musicians. And that brings us to a really interesting musician uh, that the Into America team talked to. She's an indie musician who's really figuring out um, how to be creative and figuring all this out from one of America's music capitals. When people listen to music, they're feeling the emotions and the closeness of somebody else even if they can't be in the same space as them. My name is Rachel Bayman, and I live in Madison, Tennessee, which is on the northeast side of Nashville. I'm a touring musician primarily. I play fiddle and banjo, guitar, I write songs. My husband's also a professional touring musician, and, you know, we're hustlers. We just do what we need to do, and if there's a month where I don't have enough gigs, then I'll go find something else to do in that month and and make it work. I had two big tours lined up. I was going to be about 10 to 12 days in March. And then and I had this big UK European tour lined up for May and June. I usually play with a trio. So I had bought two bandmates plane tickets. I'd applied for work visas. I'd hired a publicist to promote the tour. About maybe the end of February, my husband started saying, man, I'm getting a little worried about this coronavirus thing. And um, I'm worried it might start affecting our gigs. And and whenever he would bring that up, I was like, I, can't, I just can't think about it. Because I knew in my head, I was like, all right, that's a lot of money that I'm going to lose if this gets canceled. As it has been virtually every night since February, our lead story tonight is the coronavirus outbreak. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. Literally, the whole world is talking about this outbreak. None of us is unaffected by its impact. I left for tour on Thursday, played one show in Asheville, and then the next day the whole tour was canceled and we just turned around and drove right back home and then within a week the rest of my tours had been canceled and um, I spent a whole week just kind of sitting there watching this all crumble and just thinking, like, what, what am I going to do, you know, what, what's going to happen now? I'm looking at a debt of about $6,000 in addition to not making any money for two months. I was in a really big panic for maybe a week, and there was a lot of people that were able to kind of take that feeling and immediately turn it into um, putting together online festivals. 
Thank you guys. This is really, really fun to um, to get to do this. I've been feeling a little down today, um, just with the circumstances. I know we're all struggling in different ways. So this is when Rachel gets involved in one of the first virtual music festivals. And the name is really clever. I happen to love it. It's called Shut In and Sing. It's been running four or five nights a week since mid-March. And basically, you pay for a virtual ticket. So all the money actually goes to the artists. Everyone's live streaming from their homes. It has this kind of cool uh, do-it-yourself DIY kind of feel to it. My name is Rachel Bayman, and uh, stoked to be opening up this uh, live stream for Amy Ray tonight. I really loved hearing Lucy play as well. You know, people who wanted to see the show had to buy a ticket. They had four artists each evening. Each artist would play for about half an hour from their own home. Audience members can comment. There's a constant like chat box going, and then they can tip. They're booking a lot of different artists at different levels in their career and trying to distribute the money really equally among everyone. Um, it's very much coming from a perspective of let's help everyone. I asked my husband, George, to play a few tunes with me. That's George Jackson on the fiddle and vocals. George, they said we're a beautiful duo. Oh. Thanks for playing oh. with me. We don't, we don't <laughs> um, the chat box is a really fun thing about live streams. Hey, thank you all. It's, uh, I'm trying not to be distracted by the comments, but I appreciate reading them between the songs. So it's very, it's very warm, fuzzy. It feels great. Now, on the flip side, like for me, this platform crashed in the middle of my last song. Everyone's like, what's happening? I hate this, this is the worst. Like, you know, you also see that. Okay, is this working? We're gonna start over on that song and then we're gonna get um, our next guest on. Thank you all for sticking with us. And um, you know, we're just figuring out this new life that we lead. That was Rachel Bayman from Nashville, Tennessee, talking about the Shut In and Sing Virtual Music Festival. What do you think? I love it. I mean, a, a lot of um, musicians and DJs are finding innovative ways to get a buck for their skills. Um, really innovative ways, really, to kind of compensate for this lack of income. So Shut In and Sing is still going on, by the way. Uh, you can find the link in our show page. So, Bonsu, um, you know, we've found life through music uh, during these tough times, but the music community and all of us really have taken some pretty uh, hefty losses. We've lost some, some music greats to COVID, like John Prine right there in Nashville uh, last week, who, yeah, man, was an absolute legend. He was only 73. But also Ellis Marcellus. When you think about the legendary family, his lineage, what he's meant to New Orleans, a city that has weathered storm after storm, um, and now this. This is a big blow, man. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, a condol my condolences to the Marsalis family. I mean, he's a godfather. And, in the, you know, outside of, of, of giving us these these great musicians, these great jazz musicians, I mean, the work that he, he also put into Louisiana, New Orleans during Katrina, I mean, and for him not to be able to be celebrated Louisiana style, it's just a tragedy. He died on April 1st. He was 85 years old. And I spent years in New Orleans, and New Orleans has, has been special to me. I spent many days, many afternoons, in second lines, 
where you, you're drinking in line behind a brass band, the second line funerals, what it means to say goodbye in New Orleans, and for that community not to send the great Ellis Marcellus away is one of the deeper blows, I think. It's, you know, this whole COVID-19 situation, it's cut salt, cut salt, cut salt. <laughs> Each wound is, is burns with another level of it. And this is a bad one, man. Absolutely, absolutely. There's one song in particular that I will think of when I think of Ellis Marcellus, and it is, Do You Know What It Means to Miss New Orleans? Mm. right back. So when you were a kid, did you play any instruments, sing? What role did music play in young Bonesu's life? Oh, man, music was everything. Always been my lifeline. Um, it's always been my escape. It's been my therapy. And I, I really feel for teenagers right now because they're not getting that fellowship. You know, they're not being able to go to the park and huddle and maybe freestyle, you know, like I used to do. I don't think COVID-19 will, will shake that love of music in young people. Our team was also thinking about uh, kids and music. School was canceled all across the country. But also think of the spring recitals, the concerts that kids and family were really looking forward to canceled, but our team found one choir and an intrepid choir director in Seattle who said simply the show, or at least part of the show, must go on. Rise, oh mothers, rise, let's go meet them in the skies. My name is Abby Asadi. I live in Seattle, Washington, and I'm in 10th grade. I sing in the Seattle Girls Choir, and I'm a first soprano. My name is Jacob Winkler. I am the artistic director of the Seattle Girls Choir. We're really, really close as a community, which is amazing. And we'll have sleepovers and things like that, which is really fun. There's a, a very real sense of family in it for me as well. An important part of this whole job is seeing the difference that it makes in our choristers' lives. I found out that the March concerts were canceled by Jake. I think he sent a message saying that, you know, we wouldn't have any more concerts. And I just remember feeling really sad. But also remember, social distancing started really early in Seattle before anywhere else in the United States. Right. Listening to those kids is heartbreaking. Choir director Jacob had to get really creative, and he did. There's a composer named Eric Whitaker, who's sort of uh, the movie star of choral composers. The first virtual choir I ever saw, 2010, he did a virtual choir, and that had 185 people who sent in their parts. We had a major fundraiser that was scheduled for March 14th. The shutdown being enforced on us by the coronavirus seemed to be actually a, a perfect opportunity to try that uh, sort of fundamentally different approach. So the first step was learning the music. No time to tarry. The first thing I did to put this together was I recorded the piano part. Then I made a video of myself conducting to the piano part. I put that on YouTube. 
sent that link to our members and they then viewed that video and they made a video of themselves singing the part. In the video, I'm wearing headphones because I'm listening to a track and a video made by our director, Jake. There's also a piano track underneath with a metronome going so we can all try to be on time together. No time to tarry here. No time to wait for you. No and I'm watching the video while I'm singing, watching when the cutoffs are, things like that. Recording it separately was really hard. I was talking with some of the other girls and they were all saying, you know, it took so many tapes, like hours. Some of our members agonize over it and they, would, they spent two hours trying to get the right take to send to me. When you're singing by yourself, you have nothing to base your pitch off of, your rhythm off of, other than the conductor, obviously, but there's some sort of feeling that I can't really describe that you get when you're singing with a group that is lost when you're singing by yourself. If the person I'm standing next to makes a slight adjustment, I can hear that and adjust my voice to theirs to make sure everything works out. They all sent me videos. I took the audio out of the videos and then I brought it into an audio editor and I lined all the parts up and then mixed all the sound together. And then I ran it through digital reverberation software to have it try to simulate that acoustical space that you get when you're in a concert hall. and then went essentially through the same process again of getting all the videos to line up so that when you see the, the singer's lips moving, it matches the audio that I had already mixed together. I'm sure it was really hard to get it all to line up, but it did. You know, I didn't start a clock every time I worked on it, but it was a lot of time. I think overall, I probably spent about 30 hours on it. No time to tarry here, no time to wait for you, no time to tarry here for I'm on my journey home. My favorite part of the experience was Probably seeing it all come together, I was a little bit dismayed maybe when I sent in my recording because it wasn't very good, but then it all came together. The last time I looked, it was up over 32,000 views. We would have never performed for 32,000 people or however many have viewed it, um, which is awesome. My friends who might not come to a concert, I got to send it to them too and say, you know, this is what I do after school, this is why I can't um, play a sport all the time. Even though we're social distancing, there's some sense of community that's been brought out of that that is kind of new and wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been on this big, huge shutdown. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. We're in this situation and may as well make the best of it. Singing or listening to music is a really great way to still feel connected even in this time when we're super disconnected. But always music is important. It always makes you feel good.
That was Abby Asadi and director Jacob Winkler of the Seattle Girls Choir talking about their virtual performance of the song, No Time. You know, the painstaking work it took to make that happen and the dedication and commitment, not just by conductor Jacob, but the kids, I'm, I'm blown, man. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. How many kids were there? Uh, 20. Amazing. I mean, I felt the young lady when she was talking about um, singing by yourself as opposed to with a choir. I mean, the reason why choirs are so powerful is because it's this combustive energy, this, com- this combination of energies that makes this one great energy. I, I definitely feel her on that, you know. And, and somehow they made it happen. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. What's, what's grabbing your attention these days? You know, there have been a, a, a bunch of random moments um, that have just filled me with some warmth. And, you know, during these dark days, you know, I'll take all the warmth I can get. Um, there was a nurse, and I'm not sure exactly where she was, but you could tell it was kind of the end of a long day and a long shift. And we have all heard the horror stories that our frontline healthcare workers are going through. This woman is leaning on a wall and she's singing Amazing Grace. And it's just washing over everyone in the room. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And it just it just did something to me, man, where it's just it was so beautiful. It, it just runs through you to the core. Oh, man. But now I see. The next moment that stands out for me, it does a little something different. From the mouths of children, there's great joy. Take a listen to this one. Don't worry about a thing. Cause I love it. For those of you at home uh, who haven't seen this, if you look at this kid's face with all confidence and his beautiful little smile saying everything's going to be all right, I believe him. I just, I just look at his face, I hear his little voice, and I believe him. I woke up this morning on my horizon. Three little birds were on my doorstep singing sweet songs. Is there a more fitting and, and necessary song right now? Melody pure and true. I don't think so. I think he got it right. <laughs> and they said this message is you. <laughs> and Tremaine, I'll add to that. I mean, use the music. It's always been a medicine. It's always been there for us. So, um, you know, whether you're trying to get through the virus or just trying to get through quarantine, this medicine has always been there for you and you know, it's, it's at your disposal now. Use it. Bonesu Thompson, you can find him in all your, your favorite magazines. Let's add screenwriter to that, journalist, music lover, and, and you're so tapped in, man. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. We really, really appreciate it and are better for it. Thank you. Appreciate you, bro. That was my friend Bonesu Thompson. He wrote an oral history of the night we talked about when more than 100,000 people joined DJ D-Nice at Club Quarantine on Instagram Live for Medium. You can find the link to that in our show notes. And before we go, one more way people are connecting right now through sound. It's not technically music, but it's sweet all the same. Maybe this is happening where you are. Each evening, at a designated time, people, just regular people, whoever feels so moved, they clap and cheer, bang pots, and generally make noise for all the first responders and essential workers who are literally putting their lives on the line for the rest of us right now. It's a reminder that we are not alone. We still have neighbors and communities and that we are rising up to support each other. (laughs) 
Into America is produced by Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, Barbara Rabb, Claire Tai, Aisha Turner, and Preeti Varathan. Special thanks to our colleagues at NBC for sending in their own recordings of the 7 p.m. clap around New York City. Original music by Hannes Brown. Our executive producer is Ellen Frankman. Steve Lichtai is executive producer of audio. I'm Tremaine Lee. We'll be back next Thursday.